Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for logging into our session today. I'm Angela Moulton. I'm a project manager and a civil engineer with CDM Smith. And I'm one of the co-founders of the Women's Environmental Network Young Professional Group. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. A special thanks to our sponsors. Also for Massachusetts attendees, TCHs are available, but you have to attend the entire session and there'll be a poll question at the end that you have to answer to be eligible for credits. So the Women's Environmental Network has been around for about 25 years. It was a grassroots kind of organization, somewhat organized in response to the old boys club of the engineering world. When not so long ago, women weren't always invited out for whiskey after work or onto the golf course. So when provided a platform for ladies to gather socially um, and just to share experiences and be mentors for one another. So the WNYP group is an extension of this. Now I've been at CDM Smith for 12 years and I'm very proud to say that senior project managers like Bob Button and John Doherty invited me out to golf almost right away. So times have changed. So the WNYP group now focuses on welcoming young female engineers and just making, making sure they feel empowered and engaged in the community. The WNYP, with the help of Mary Berry, has put together a partnership with NUIA. So over the past few months, we've been working together developing this panel discussion. Today's event is to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. We're looking forward by reflecting back so that, we, that way we can take the opportunity to prepare our members to support equal rights, equal pay, and equal treatment. Now at this point, I'll hand it over to my colleague and my friend, Michaela Bogosh, who's also a project manager and a civil engineer with CDM Smith and one of the co-founders of the WEN YP group. Michaela? Thanks, Angela. And thank you all for joining in on the discussion this afternoon. Uh, we have a great lineup for you. So I'll just take a moment to run through our agenda and touch upon the content for this panel before introducing our panel moderator, Freddie Kay. Uh, Freddie will start the event with a brief history of the evolution of the 19th Amendment and how we got there. And she'll also discuss a, a few important topics and events following the passing of the 19th Amendment. We'll then introduce our esteemed panelists and break into our moderated panel discussion. Um, we'll hit on three main discussion topics, and then each panelist will have a moment at the end to reflect and give their takeaways before opening it up to the attendee discussion um, and questions at the end. We welcome folks to submit their questions in the chat, and if you're able, please identify who from our panel uh, you'd like to respond to that specific question uh, in the chat area. So now let's introduce our moderator of our panel, Freddie Kay. Freddie began her legal career at Goodwin Proctor, and she then served as Deputy Legal Counsel to Governor Dukakis and then Governor Weld. She was appointed Director of the Massachusetts Office of Dispute Resolution, where she served from 1993 to 2000. Freddie is currently the President and Founder of the Women's Suffrage Celebration Coalition of Massachusetts. She's very passionate about preserving the legacy of the suffragists. Freddie recently served as Massachusetts Equal Pay Coalition, which successfully led to enacting the Equal Pay Act. With that, Freddie, will you please take it away? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michaela and Angela. Thank you all uh, for inviting me here. I'm thrilled to be with you here today. Thank you so very much. So I'm going to try in not too many minutes to give you an overview, if I can, of this incredible story of how women obtain the vote and a little bit of why it took so long, because it really did uh, take over 72 years, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And our hope, uh, Suffrage 100 Massachusetts is a nonprofit organization we have, and nonpartisan, and we have about 200 also nonprofit organizations that are part of our work. 
our goal is to share this incredible story of the suffrage movement, which we think so many people don't know, we were not brought up with it, and to hope that more people will appreciate and be inspired to vote and to become civically engaged. Now, as you all know, February is Black History Month and March is Women's History Month. And both of those are very relevant to today. And uh, you'll hear about that through, through this. Um, so um, while the 19th Amendment, I'll just mention, prohibits federal and state governments from denying the vote based on sex, there were other laws that prohibited groups from voting. Jim Crow laws prevented African Americans from voting, particularly in the South. Native Americans and Asian Americans also were denied the vote even after the 19th Amendment. So it's clear the amendment itself did not discriminate, but other laws prevented uh, some groups from voting, which was horrible. So, um, and as we know, um, uh, some of these issues persist. Voter suppression is still an issue and it's very important today as well. What happened was there were some really radical and brave women who spoke up when it was really, really hard to do so. So I'm going to start here, if I can see if my, uh, with Mum Bet, who changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman. And Mum Bet was a slave in Massachusetts who could not read or write, but she overheard men speaking about the Massachusetts Constitution, and she heard them say, quote, all men are born free and equal. Long story short, she went to an attorney and sued because she was not free and equal and wanted to be. And her case, and one other in particular, led to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court declaring that slavery was illegal, illegal under the Massachusetts Constitution. So she is quite a role model for us all. Now, just a few years prior to that, in 1776, Abigail Adams wrote her famous letter to her husband. Many of you may be familiar with the phrase, remember the ladies. I'm just gonna read a few more words because I think it was quite an amazing paragraph that she sent to him while he was at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Unfortunately, the response of her husband was awful. And he said, well, to depend on it, you better know that we're we will not repeal our masculine systems. Um, but it was wonderful that Abigail Adams put that out there. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the Grimke sisters, who were wealthy white sisters from the South. Their family owned slaves, and they saw the inhumanity of that and moved to Boston to become abolitionists. They became speakers for William Lloyd Garrison. And what's important about the time when they were doing this in the 1800s if audiences included men and women, those were called promiscuous audiences. And if women spoke uh, to these mixed groups, if you will, they often had rotten fruit and eggs thrown at them just because they dared to speak in, pu in public. They were shattering glass ceilings just by speaking in public. In 1838, Angelina Grimke became the first woman in the country to address a state legislature. And it was our Massachusetts State House, which was great. Now, uh, part of the reason for all this was what the, were the separate spheres that men and women were relegated to. They were completely separate. And the woman's sphere uh, was called the cult of true womanhood was where she was supposed to be. And that is the idea was that the only true woman was a pious, submissive wife and mother concerned exclusively with home and family. Now, as I go through these slides and we see these different women, these do not look like radical women, but these are radical women. Lucretia Mott was born in Nantucket. She became a minister. Her family was a Quaker family and her husband, James Mott was Quaker. And there's a Quaker th theme through many of the suffragists as you'll hear today, if you don't uh, already know about them. 
And they also worked with William Lloyd Garrison's to end slavery. One of the things they, um, what happened to them was they were elected to represent Pennsylvania at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840. Before I get to there, I'm gonna talk about Elizabeth Cady Stanton for just a moment. And as you can imagine with each of these people that I'm talking about, there are books and books and books of fabulous stories about all of these people. So I'm trying to condense it down so we can get to 1920 and beyond. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was uh, brought up in upstate New York. Her father was a lawyer and a judge. Her, um, her initiation into the world of unequal rights was really because she listened to her father take cases often from women who came to him for help, but he couldn't help them because the laws were so discriminatory. And she was very frustrated about that. One of the major issues were property rights. And when a woman married, she lost all of her property rights. She had, Elizabeth had a, an example of this. She had a, a, a very um, a beautiful coral necklace that was uh, very dear to her. In those days, women might have one very, very special necklace, and that was hers from her father. And his law clerks would taunt her and remind her that when she got married, that necklace would belong to her husband. And he could throw it out, he could give it to somebody, he could sell it, he could sell it for tobacco and smoke it up. And they taunted her with that. And that of course drove her crazy. Um, she came into her father's law office one day with a pair of scissors and he asked what was that about? And she was declaring she was going to cut up all of the laws in his office in the law books. And he let her know that there were copies all over the state and she'd have to go to Albany to change the laws, which she ultimately did try to do. And he was mortified by that and actually tried to just, he threatened to disinherit her. And I think it's wonderful that she lived to have such um, an amazing um, legacy for all of us because of her fortitude and how, how much she persevered and was strong. So she was also an abolitionist and she got married and she and her husband also went to the 1840 anti World Anti-Slavery Convention. It was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's honeymoon actually. And when they got there, it turned out that the first day of the convention was devoted to a debate about whether or not women should have the vote, have a vote at the convention and participate. And after an entire day of debate, the women lost and they had to sit separately, they were segregated uh, and it was quite the outrage. William Lloyd Garrison arrived late to the convention and when he got there, he was furious and he sat with the women and gave up his vote as did Raymond, um, from um, from Salem, Massachusetts as well. Charles Remont also joined him. Uh, there's a story that it's not been confirmed, I guess, but an interesting one that it's possible that Lucretia and Elizabeth, Lucretia was older, she had five children. Uh, she was well along in her career. Elizabeth was a young woman with no children at that time. And um, there's a story that they talked and decided, well, we need a women's rights convention. Uh, we don't know if that's true or not, but we do know that eight years later in 1848, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was now living in Seneca Falls and Lucretia Mott was visiting her sister. She was there for just a week or so and the women got together and decided let's put together a convention and if we do it now while Lucretia is in town, she will draw a crowd. People knew Lucretia far and wide, even though she was living in Pennsylvania. So they literally threw together this convention that became the first women's rights um, convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. And they needed to put something together to outline their wishes, if you will. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very learned. She was brilliant. And she came up with the idea to call it the Declaration of Sentiments based on the Declaration of Independence. Um, and they included the words, all men and women are created equal. Something that was really, really important to her was that she include that women have the right to vote. Lucretia Mott and some others were very concerned that that was asking too much, but uh, it turns out at the day of the convention, Frederick Douglass was there and he agreed with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and he helped convince the crowd, if you will, that they should support women having the vote included in this declaration. 
As it turns out, all of the items in the Declaration of Sentiments about property rights, et cetera, were adopted unanimously except the right to vote, which was not adopted unanimously. So it was kind of foreboding of what was to come. Um, and two years later, in 1850 and 1851, the first National Women's Rights Convention was held in Worcester, Massachusetts. Who knew? This was a really big deal. And it was called the National Convention because there were 11 states represented, 1,000 women the next year where there were 3,000 people. Um, you may be able to see that that's Sojourner Truth there. She came and spoke at the convention. And a year later, she gave her Ain't I a Woman's Speech. Um, this is a picture of what the press, if I can get this, the press put out, it's a caricature and a cartoon, if you will, of a drawing that really made fun of the women. And this was a really good example of how bad press can be helpful because it ran in newspapers across the country about what these outrageous women and men were doing. Um, and they made fun of them, but they did earn them a lot of support because of that. Lucy Stone is from West Springfield, Massachusetts. I hope you've heard of her, an incredible woman, the first woman in Massachusetts to graduate from college from Oberlin, another huge story. Um, Henry Blackwell desperately wanted to marry her. He pursued her for two years. And only when they came to an agreement about, um, about an, an equal arrangement and that she would be able to retain her rights, would she agree to marry him. And that rights would, she would retain her property rights upon marriage and keep her last name. So she retained her name as Lucy Stone. And those who have, uh, women who have kept their names after marriage are often called Lucy Stoners. Um, they were the publishers and editors of the Women's Journal, which became a national weekly publication for over 40 years. Their influence went nationwide. And um, we are currently uh, working on a sign outside the State House. For, um, for Lucy Stone and her work because she was the first woman to speak for suffrage at a legislative hearing. And she spoke about women getting the vote in particular when they were trying to get the constitutional uh, constitution amended through a constitutional convention that was 1853 and it failed, unfortunately. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, um, Francis Harper, all fantastic abolitionists and suffragists. And it was wonderful that they spoke out uh, it, for suffrage as well as for um, to abolish slavery. The 15th Amendment came along and this was a major problem. Um, let me just see, sorry. Um, and that was because for the first time, it was a proposal which was adopted that inserted that men could get the right to vote, that African-American men would get the right to vote, but not women. And prior to this, these these groups had been working together, the suffragists and the abolitionists, and they were seeking universal suffrage for everyone. But um, there was a decision that they, if they asked for that, it would be too much. They had to just start with this. Some supported that, some did not. It split the movement and it was, it was, a, it was a really, really rough time. It split the movement for 20 years with Lucy Stone on one side who had supported the 15th Amendment and Anthony and Stanton on another side. In 1872, um, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting. She argued that the newly passed 14th Amendment applied, but she was denied. It made national news because the judge made the mistake of asking her, do you have anything to say? <laughs> she did, she had a lot to say and made an incredible speech that uh, did go national. As we, as we would say today, it went viral and it helped gather a lot more support and fame for her. In 1879, women in Massachusetts gained the right to vote for school committee. Now, why was that? It was because this sphere of being in charge of your home and your children meant that um, they could argue, well, at least you should give us a right for this, to vote for school committee. And, ultimately, and that did pass, which was great. Among the women who voted very proudly was Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin um, on the left, who um, was a founder of the NAACP Boston chapter, and Mariah Baldwin on the right, who taught in Cambridge. She taught at a predominantly white school for over 40 years, but partway through that, she was made the principal and then the master. And she introduced things like mathematics education, established parent-teacher groups, and introduced the position 
of school nurse. And E.E. E. Cummings was one of her favorite students who always spoke very, very highly of her. And the school in Cambridge is now named after her. So Josephine and Mariah were friends. They also created black women's clubs for women. There were some in the country that were growing very large, but they were racist. And there were a lot of issues for them where they couldn't participate, so they created their own. They also, in 1895, organized the first national conference of black women, and that was in Boston. And they were addressing issues important to African Americans, including lynchings, lynchings and they were awful, also suffragists. The um, two suffrage groups reunited in 1890. Um, and at this point, groups were working state by state to get the vote. This is uh, Alice Paul, who came onto the scene. She's from New Jersey. She went to Britain and became a suffragette. That's a British term for the militant suffragists. And Alice Paul became what we might call radicalized today, but she came back to the States. And in 1913, okay, we're up, we're up to 1913, 12 states had adopted suffrage for women. But, and there, keep in mind, there were 48 states in the country and only 12 had adopted it. And all of those states were west of the Mississippi. So she was anxious to ramp it up, if you will. She insisted on, um, on doing it safely. That's a picture of the British suffragettes because in Britain, they were called suffragettes. Uh, in the United States, they were suffragists. Um, so uh, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns created this amazing parade in Washington, D.C. in 1913. The day before Woodrow Wilson was to be inaugurated, he arrived at Union Station and said, where are all the people? They were at this huge, huge parade. I'm sorry to say that Ida B. Wells um, was told she had to march in the back. She refused uh, and ended up joining her group from Illinois with two white allies who helped her walk in and walk in the parade were with her delegation. And there's a new book that has just come out this month about Ida B. Wells by her great grand, by her granddaughter, her great granddaughter. At the inauguration just a couple of weeks ago, President Biden spoke about that march. Uh, he said, here we stand where 108 years ago at another inaugural, thousands of protesters tried to block brave women marching for the right to vote. And today we mark the swearing in of the first woman in history elected to national office, Vice President Kamala Harris. He added, don't tell me things can't change. Um, so in Massachusetts, we were still trying to get the vote by state by state efforts. And there was a, con there was a, um, a referendum to go to the, to the voters, which were all men. And so they had these huge parades by juxtaposition. In, 19, in 2017, many of you may have attended as I did the Women's March in Boston, where there were 175,000 marchers, protesters at this march in 2017. In 1915, there were 500,000 spectators and 12,000 marchers. And one month later, it was defeated at the polls. Three other straight states also tried, November 1915, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. They all failed, I'm sorry to say. Um, Alice Paul decided to do something new and different, and that was to start picketing the White House. The first people ever to picket the White House were the suffragists. They were called the silent sentinels. They did not speak, they held signs, and they targeted the president in particular, Mr. President, how long must we wait? They were there for two and a half years, six days a week in all kinds of weather, 2,000 women, they were arrested and jailed and beaten. And this is a picture of from the night of terror of Lucy Burns. And I'm wearing, you may not be able to see it, a jail door pen, which is used to commemorate what was going on there. Um, this was um, not long after that in Massachusetts when uh, they were trying to get Woodrow Wilson to push through the amendment in Congress to amend the constitution. He came to Boston on his way back from Europe and that was February 24, 19, 1919. And this is a picture of the women who protested and were jailed, the last women in the country to pick a Woodrow Wilson and to be jailed, uh, to be arrested and jailed were in Boston and they were arrested and sent to the Charles Street Jail. There were 22 of these women. 
In June of 1919, finally, the amendment was ratified by Congress. And then we move into uh, February 1920, I'm sorry, June 4, 1919, it was adopted by Congress. And by the end of June, Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify, so things had changed. 36 states are needed. February 1920, I talked about this group that had come together and gone apart and came back together, that was NASA. And NASA in 1920 changed their name to become the League of Women Voters. And that's where the League of Voters comes from. They were truly a suffragist organization. We're down to one state to get the vote to pass the 19th Amendment. It's Tennessee and other states have voted up or down. This is it. The youngest member of the legislature, a 24 year old Harry Byrne is on the floor wearing a red rose, which means you're opposed. And while he's on the floor of the legislature, this is after weeks and weeks of lobbying and debate, prohibition was involved. The, the liquor was flowing. The railroad industry was involved. They were all opposed to women getting the vote. Harry Byrne received a letter on the floor of the legislature and the letter was from his mother telling him to vote for suffrage. And he changed, he took his red rose off and he voted for suffrage. He had to escape outside of a window. That was August 18, 1920. And it took until August 26, 1920 when uh, it was signed into law. And I will mention, um, and this was the celebration that happened with the 36th state being added to the flag. People who did not get the vote with that. Um, chi Chinese Americans, this is a picture of Japanese Americans. Um, and Native Americans. So the Chinese Exclusion Repeal Act in 1943 uh, was that helped it repealed an earlier one. And finally, um, the McLaren Walter Act in 1952. I'm sorry, so laws need to be passed in 1952 ultimately that enabled Asian Americans uh, to be able to become citizens, which was the key to voting. And still today, people in, in our territories, Puerto Rico and Guam, cannot vote in federal elections. Also want to talk about this is the Pettus Bridge and the fight for the vote. Uh, you may not be able to read it, but the signs these young people are holding is about voting. And I'm very pleased that finally, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law. And as you all know, this civil rights movement lasted for decades to overturn the Jim Crow laws. It was horrible and bloody and there were incredible women, Fannie Lou Hamer comes to mind, who were fighting desperately for the right to vote. So, um, and the other piece is that of course, part of that has been, has been retracted, if you will, by the Supreme Court in a case called Shelby. And so there is still much, much work to do um, to have access to voting, it still goes on. And oh, one more thing that's important, the Equal Rights Amendment. Where did that come? Oh, in 1923, Alice Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment with other people and introduced it every year. She lived until the 1970s, long enough to see it adopted by Congress. But as we all know, it still has not been adopted, although uh, Virginia recently did, but there are technical issues. So we're not quite there yet. Um, I'm going to end with that and encourage you to see there's a film we put together that I hope you'll enjoy called The Fight for Women's Suffrage, Looking Back, Marching Forward. It's on our website, Suffrage 100 MA. You can click on it anytime, and I hope that you might enjoy, um, might enjoy that. Um, behind me, I don't know if you can see it, there's a poster of Ida B. Wells. Those are on our website. We have a lot of books. There are endless, endless wonderful books and movies, and I encourage you to check those out as well. I'm always happy to answer any questions. And please uh, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we continue to tell the stories of the amazing suffragists that many of us knew nothing about. Thank you so very much. All right, now I will thank you so much, Freddie, for that presentation. It was really interesting and informative. Um, I will now introduce our panelists um, that we are very happy to have. So first off, we have Liz Levin, who is board, a board member of Norman Day Associates. She's the co-author of a book, Boots on the Ground, Flats in the Boardroom. I'm reading it now. It's fantastic. 
She served on the board of directors for MassDOT and for the MBTA, and she's chaired the Massachusetts Government Appointees Project, which is dedicated to advocating for women in government. And she is a co-founder and original member of the Women's Environmental Network, the group that Angela talked about earlier. Next, we have Phyllis Arnold Rand, who's a water quality coordinator at the Greater, sorry, at the Greater Augusta Utility District up in Maine. She was the 2006 NUIA president and the 1995 Maine Water Environment um, Association president, and she was the first African American woman to serve in both of those roles. She has over 30 years of experience in the wastewater treatment profession and is a former Maine DEP industrial and municipal permit writer. She's also a mayoral appointee to the city of Lewiston, Maine Planning Board of Appeals. Next, we have Megan U. Schneider. She is the founder and president of Seven Management and Consulting. She's also vice president on the board of directors for the Municipal Water District of Orange County in California. She's the first woman of color and first female engineer elected to represent a population of 3.2 million. She serves on the National Science Foundation Joint Committee for Drinking Water Additives and is the co-chair of the WEF Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Board Subcommittee. And last but not least, we have Elisa Speranza. She's the president of Seventh Ward Strategies and an independent board member. And she has over 30 years of experience in various roles in the government, nonprofit and private sectors, including being the former deputy director at MWRA. Um, she is the former C-suite executive and board member at CH2M Hill. And she is the, another co-founder and original member of the Women's Environmental Network. She's also a NUIA 5S member. So with that, I will turn it back over to Freddie and kick off our conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And uh, let me just say, as you can tell from these incredible women and their backgrounds, I think that these are suffragists who have continued along uh, pioneering in, this, uh, in their fields. And certainly all of you have chosen, and I know those of you who are, are participating or watching this program, you're in a field that has been largely male dominated and good for you. So thank you for breaking glass ceilings every day in what you do. So, and I'm very honored to be your moderator today and excited to hear from all of you. Our first question today is what does equitable voting mean to you? So I'm wondering from your personal and your work experiences, can you each talk a little bit about what it means to you for voting to be equitable, to be available to everyone? And I'll start with you, Liz Levin. Thank you. Uh, equitable voting to me recognizes that fair access to voting has to happen. And it was thus with great happiness this year that in California, I was sent as one of 23 million people, 23 registered voters, I was sent a ballot to fill out at home. And I sat there, I filled it out at home. I was able to find near me a drop box that I didn't have to wait for or whatever. And my experience overall showed that you can have access, but we have too many people who don't have access and working so that it is equitable is only fair and right. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, and Phyllis, Phyllis Rand, can you talk about that please? Yes, um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, Shelby County versus Holder. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start with that because that, um, that court case that was uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013 mothballed an extremely important section of the Voting Rights Act. Um, that's just in a nutshell what, what that did. That section required certain states that had a history of racial uh, discrimination in voting before they could change any of their voting rules, they had to be, those changes had to be pre-approved. Um, well, that, um, so the Supreme Court over, the Supreme Court deemed that section uh, unconstitutional. 
And as a matter of fact, Justice um, Roberts said that, um, you know, the, the, the act was, you know, back in 1965 and a lot of things had changed since then. So we didn't really need that section anymore. Well, immediately after that section was um, overturned, the state of Texas instituted voter ID laws and other states um, that had been a part of this group um, sought to uh, remove ballot boxes and polling places. And so getting into what equitable voting means to me is, is putting those places back there, those voting places and um, the, the ballot boxes in those areas that are accessible to black and brown people. Um, this also means calling out self-serving politicians who want to disenfranchise minority votes by saying that they are illegal or tainted somehow. It means enforcing federal laws against voter intimidation at the polls and at ballot boxes. And it means, and I would want to see uh, voter registrations and voter uh, ballot envelopes postage paid so that it makes it easier, not a challenge, to participate in a right that we all have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. And now, uh, Megan U. Schneider, who's joining us from California, I think. <laughs> That's right, and thank you. And I just wanted to touch on what Liz and Phyllis said and build on that because I think they really highlighted the importance of access to voting and how that translates to equitable voting. But I also wanted to build on that in the sense that I think it's important that we empower each voter to recognize that they have a voice and to empower them with the ability to vote for individuals that reflect their values and, and their viewpoints as well. And I speak from that having not only serving as a minority and as a, a, a woman, but even in professional associations, I've been able to serve on boards where I was often the youngest member and having that difference in perspective and having that diversity in thought also helps lead to better decisions that benefit who we're serving at the end of the day. So I just recently went through board training for two different boards and we, we, it was drilled into us, right? That you represent your members, that you represent your communities, that you represent your entire constituency. And it's important to recognize that when our boards do not have diversity in terms of background, in terms of lived experiences, in terms of perspectives, it's difficult for us to truly vet solutions and ideas that benefit our constituents, our community, and our members. Regardless of what board you sit on, equitable voting for me also means not only having access to that vote, but also feeling empowered and knowing that your vote counts, that your vote matters and that you have a voice and that you have an ability to influence that decision and that you have an ability and, and I have a right to be represented. And so to me, equitable voting means all of those things in addition to all the myriad of issues in terms of having the time, getting the ability to go to a voting place or getting the time and ability to research the issues and being able to vote by mail whatever that may be, I think the logistics are important, but also that empowerment and recognizing that all of our votes count is important as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Elisa Speranza, who's joining us, I think from Atlanta. New Orleans. New Orleans, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, hi, it everybody. One of those warm states, you're not having- Yes, it is. I won't, I'll try not to rub it in. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, and it's a great question, and I'll, I'll just echo everything that uh, the three other ladies said uh, about access to voting and um, voting rights, all the, all the ideas that have been put forth for Election Day as a national holiday, um, simplifying the franchise and making it, making it more accessible. I'm 100% in favor of all of that, but also, as Megan said, too, um, giving people a reason to go out and vote, and I think uh, I want to shout out to Stacey Abrams, who's one of my heroes for getting getting people out to vote and making sure that she fights against uh, against disenfranchisement in her state. It's something that I think a lot of states, especially here in the South where I live now, 
are looking at doing. Um, but on top of that, you know, when I was thinking about this question, what would it mean? Not, not just what it would look like, but what would it mean if more people did vote? Um, and I think it would mean, because we've seen some evidence of this, more enlightened public policy, more attention to, to issues that impact people and families, more attention paid, and this is near and dear to all of our hearts, to issues involving environmental, uh, environmental justice, environmental protection, environmental stewardship, infrastructure, building for the future, you know, for future generations and protecting our, our natural environment and public health. Um, all of those things that we care about so much in NUIA and in, in WEF and in the organizations that we're part of. Um, you know, I think that more enlightened and more educated voters and more involved um, and engaged voters will hopefully support more rate increases to support our our public infrastructure as well, because they'll understand and value it. So the ripple effects from more people voting, um, I think are far and wide and, you know, more people voting for diverse boards. And I want to talk about that a little bit later too, not just in the public realm, but in the private corporate world as well. So I think um, there are only upsides from my point of view to encouraging uh, the franchise to be expanded and accessible uh, for everyone. Thank you so much. Um, we have two more questions before we go to wrap up and then hopefully to take Q&A. So we may have to condense these a little bit, but I wanna switch now to um, thinking about your work world, if you will. And the question is, do you have a work experience where women in or not in leadership roles um, have affected you? And for this one, I'm gonna start with Phyllis. And you're joining us from Maine, right? I'll try to identify that. Yes, I'm, fr I'm, I'm in Maine. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, my experience is um, the lack of women in leadership roles, specifically the lack of Black women in leadership roles. Now, let me start with saying this. I was, when I first began in, in this profession, um, I was very fortunate to have an employer who um, allowed me to participate in my state and uh, regional wastewater organizations, Maine Water Environment Association and NUIA. Um, when I became chair of NUIA's Laboratory Practices Committee, I attended my first executive committee meeting uh, with all chairs, so it's about 35, maybe 40 people. And uh, I noticed I was the only black woman in the room. Uh, now as a minority living in Maine, you know, I, that's come, I come to expect that. But um, it was jarring to uh, be in this room with an organization that had over 2000 members throughout the entire New England region. I was intimidated for about a minute, <laughs> but um, I felt that my voice was just as important as the person next to me, in front of me, or sitting at the head of the table. And my passion for my profession kept me moving forward in the organization. And I eventually became president of New York. Now, along the way, um, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. over several years and meet with our congressional delegations to discuss the issues and the issues, the concerns, and the recommendations from our members, and to also serve as a resource for um, our congressional delegation to contact if they had questions about bills that were coming out that would affect our industry. It was very, very, um, it was a very good situation and worked out well for, for our organizations. Um, so, I, even though at the time I was the only black woman in the room, I didn't feel like the only black woman in the room because I had a role to play. I had stuff to say. And um, I've just been really, really pleased with how it's going. But there's always room for more. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Megan. Thank you. And, and I love the way you ended that, Phyllis, because I want to build on that, where you said that there's always room for more. And I think all of us, 
men and women alike, we can all relate to positive and not so positive experiences where we've experienced different encounters in our work life. And so I think what's important is to highlight the examples of positive role models and really be cognizant and intentional in how we represent what leadership looks like, as well as making sure that we empower rising leaders to to feel comfortable in succeeding by being authentic, by being genuine, by being caring, by being empathetic, and all of the qualities that we're truly looking for in our ideal business leaders. And so I think part of it is recognizing, as Phyllis said, there's always room for more. I think sometimes it's very easy for us, it's, it's human nature to go, well, I'm here, so things are changing. But the reality of it is, is we have a long ways to go. And so it's really important that we recognize that it's not just about creating seats at the table, it's about creating a bigger table so that we can have more seats, so that we can have more robust conversation, so that we can have more perspectives, so that we can truly vet our ideas, our really have dialogue to really think about what is it that we're trying to do here. Particularly when it comes to water and the environment, we're impacting every single human being in the same way. And so it's really important that we take into consideration all of the different individuals who are impacted, not just the men at the table, because our industry, the Brookings Institute has a report that was published in 2019. We are still today 85% male and 65% white. And so no matter how much progress we've made, we are far, far behind the curve when it comes to representing our population and representing our communities. And so for every woman who has a seat at the table, for every person of color that has a seat at the table, there are still voices missing from that table. There are still perspectives that are missing. And so what I want to empower everyone to think about is the fact that everyone has the ability to help create that space. And so those leadership roles and examples and role models don't have to be just women. In fact, one of the most impactful people in my life was a middle-aged white male. And he was my second boss who pulled me into his office one day and said, look, you have three disadvantages. I have three distinct advantages. And I had no idea where he was going with this because this was decades ago before we had open conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when he pulled me into his office to have this conversation, I was a little taken aback. But he said, look, you're a woman, you're a person of color, and you're not 60. So he said, you're going to have to work twice as hard, if not harder, and you're going to have to know three times as much information to even get your voice heard. And so he did everything that he could to create opportunities for me, to empower me to share my thoughts and perspectives. And he gave me a bit opportunities to showcase my abilities. And that's, that's something that everyone can do. That's something that anyone can do regardless of who they are or where they are. And so I think it's really important to be able to physically see women in roles of leadership, but it's also important to recognize that everybody has the ability to make a difference by creating space for other voices to be heard. And being allies, right? Having allies. Absolutely. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, Alisa. Well, amen to all of the above, first of all. Um, and I'm smiling because um, Angela did such a good job of, of recapping the little history of the Women's Environmental Network. And it just warms my heart that there is a, a YP committee of the Women's Environmental Network. And when you mentioned the people that brought you in, it made me think about Bob, Bob Button's father, I try not to cry, uh, Charlie Button. Uh, and to Meg's point, there were, there were, it's just a little shout out to some of these men in my company, we call them the men who get it. Uh, people like Charlie Button and John Sullivan and Bobby Catone and, and others who, when I was a YP back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, reached out and made sure that I was involved and signed me up for committees and voluntold me to get involved with, uh, with NUIA uh, and other organizations. So um, as Megan said, there's, there's, there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, stuff to do and, and a lot of us with the energy and a lot of younger and up and coming women who need that, that just that door opened um, and all of you are, are living proof of that. So thank you to all of them and to thank, and to you. I'll give you just two quick examples of workplaces that I was in where it made a difference in a positive way to have women at the table. 
Um, first was MWRA when I first, I was the third person hired at MWRA back in the, in the middle eighties. And on our board of directors was Lorraine Downey and Peggy Riley from Winthrop. Uh, and Lorraine is still a lifelong friend and um, someone many of you know, and also a co-founder of our Women's Environmental Network. She should have been on this panel probably. Um, and just for me as a young woman coming into the industry, not an engineer, um, kind of seeing where I could make a difference on the public policy and public involvement side of things, having those two women on our, on our board of directors and not just sitting on the board and making decisions, but really taking an interest in the staff and, and all of us and making sure that we had a voice and we were, um, we were supported in what we were doing meant a great deal to me at the time. Um, and the second example I'll give is, is in the corporate world at CH2M, where I was lucky enough to be at the company when we had our first female CEO. Uh, and Jackie Hinman took over the company at a very troubled time, of course, because I don't know, for some reason, women and people of color uh, often will be asked to step into leadership positions and clean up other people's messes, um, which is what happened to her. But um, she immediately brought more women to the leadership table, and it made a big difference for us in terms of what the company could do to support corporate social responsibility and diversity and equity and inclusion uh, and um, other things that were important to us and to our corporate culture and our values, um, which were kind of front and center uh, with more, more women at the leadership table. So um, if you're the only woman at the leadership table or if you're the only woman on your committee or and Phyllis said it well, you know, we've, we've all been in those situations, look around and see what you can do to bring another woman to the table because it'll exponentially increase the effectiveness of whatever organization uh, you're a part of. Um, and if you need strategies, how to do that, let us know. Thank you so much. Uh, Liz, and I think I forgot to mention earlier, you're joining us from California, if I'm correct. Warm weather. Warm weather. Uh, Anne Hirschbang was a woman I wanted to acknowledge here as having a tremendous effect on my uh, career. She was on the, she was appointed by Dukakis to the Massport Board, and she was also on the MTA, the Turnpike Authority Board. She was very unusual at the turnpike because she painted the bridges bright colors and she told them that they couldn't mow the grass anymore, that the grass was just to, to grow. Anne recruited me to get on the national board of uh, WTS, which is a group of, of women in transportation, then about probably 3,000. And so I went on the board and then I followed her to be the national president of WTS. And they had an agenda uh, that was basically uh, um, involving women in terms of advancing them and also building a network uh, nationwide. And I was part of that movement and very proud of it. And later asked me, uh, at, was later encouraged me to go on the board of MassDOT and the MBTA, which I did. And then she moved to Walk Boston, uh, Walk Boston, the first advocacy group for walking, and I came over there when she was ready. So I loved Anne in the sense that she made leadership easy and so fun, and I was, I am so happy to, to be a part of that. Freddie, can I just throw in one more thing? Because I, I, need, I need to acknowledge Liz in all of this. Um, you know, Liz, the Women's Environmental Network was Liz's idea. And I think we were all, you know, we all kind of woke up the next morning and we were involved. Um, but Liz has been kind of a singular force of nature in all of this for many of us. And I think the ripples from Liz's advocacy for women in general and particular women, including myself, Liz is the type of person who, if you were at a, a conference or a party or an event, she would, even if she just met you, she would say, Mary, come and meet my friend so-and-so, so-and-so, meet Mary. She's fabulous. She's the best. You need to know each other. And she would know there was a reason that she was making that introduction. And if more of us did that, and I've always tried to emulate that, Liz, and, and I just want to acknowledge your, you know, you didn't have to do that. And you, you went out of your way and you still do to serve as a mentor for, for so many of us over the years. So um, it just makes me smile to see, to see you here. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was wonderful. And Liz, Liz has a book. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. What's the name of that, Liz? Boots, boots on the ground, flats in the boardroom, transportation, women tell their stories. Thank you. And I will take this opportunity to say that I understand after this panel discussion and so forth, an email uh, communication may go out to everyone that will include resources. And I'm sure we'll be sure to include that uh, book as well. Um, this is wonderful. Um, so we'll go to, our, and I'm trying not to cry. These are really wonderful. And I want to thank each of you for opening up and sharing these really, really important stories that had to do with your careers and how you were able to succeed and, and progress and what it took, both internal fortitude by yourself and others helping as well. Um, so uh, another question is, where do we go from here to ensure diverse representation in the water industry uh, and leadership? And how, uh, what can we do now to achieve this goal? And for this one, I'm gonna start with Megan. Great, thank you so much, Freddie. What a loaded question. And you know, I, there are a hundred different ways I wanna answer this question. So I'll just try to touch on a few of them. But recently I was listening to a podcast, uh, Brene Brown has a beautiful podcast called Unlocking Us. And Melinda Gates was featured on one of these podcasts talking about her book, The Moment of Lift. And Melinda was talking about the fact that, you know, a lot of us think we're 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 50 years away from achieving equality between men and women here in the United States. And if you go to the website, equalitycantwait.com, it actually tells us that we are 208 years away from achieving equality simply between men and women here in the United States. So I want you to kind of sit with that for a second and let that soak in. At the rate that we're achieving change, we are 208 years away. And I wanna challenge all of us to take a moment to look in front of the mirror sometime today and say, how, do, how does that make me feel? And what can I do about it? Because I'm going to introduce a pretty touchy subject right now and say, as we have these conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I hear a lot of fear. And I've been the recipient of a lot of those comments and a lot of those calls where, you know, what about my son? What's that future gonna look like for him? Or what about me? I'm not a person of color. I feel left out of that conversation. And that's why I think it's so important that we're very intentional about the conversations that we have. And that's why I emphasize so much on the empowerment of recognizing that everybody has a voice and that everybody has a role to play. And that when we achieve equity, when we achieve inclusivity, everybody that benefits, our entire community benefits. One of my favorite thought leaders, Adam Grant, talks about you know, people wanting pieces of the pie. And I think sometimes we get stuck thinking that the pie is the same size and we're all splitting the same pie into more slices. But really, when we achieve inclusivity and equity, we're, we're baking a much bigger pie. So everyone can actually take bigger slices and it's not about dividing that fixed pie. And so when we talk about diverse representation in the water industry, we have to recognize that someone isn't losing something in order to create space and create an ability for underrepresented groups to have a voice. We're actually all gaining something collectively together. And so when we talk about recruitment, it's so important that we also focus on retention. And we have so much science, so much research, so much data to back all of this up. And so the efforts have to be multifaceted all over the board. The NSF has grants available to help girls and young women who are pursuing STEM related degrees, not only pick a STEM degree, but stick with it and graduate with a STEM degree because they've recognized that a lot of young girls and women will pick a STEM major, but then not see themselves finishing it. And so they switch. And I'll just be honest, as a female chemical engineer who graduated in the 2000s, I was actually advised along with many of my female peers to pick a different degree. 
because chemical engineering was hard and it was tough. And so I saw my classroom of, you know, about half women, half men turn into a graduating class of four women. And so the reality is we have to be there and have those conversations and represent to our young students that there are successful women in many different roles. There are successful people of color in many different roles so that these students can see themselves in those roles. But when we have them graduate with those degrees, we also need to make sure that we show them these people in abilities and career paths where they can also picture themselves so that we not only recruit them, but we retain them. And so my biggest thing today is just, just take a moment and be real with yourself and say, what can I do? And if we're not comfortable with it, what can I learn more about to help me understand why diversity, equity, and inclusion benefits me? No matter who you are, no matter what your background is. And I think the more we educate and inform ourselves, the more we can feel empowered to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, if, uh, if we're gonna go to touchy subjects, I'll, I, I, it's a, a couple of things, three answers to that question that I, I thought about. One is it won't happen by itself. Um, there are a lot of times where you, you look at an organization and it's not as diverse as it should be and people go, well, we tried. Well, I'm sorry, but they didn't really try. Um, and it's on white people to do some of this work, to do most of this work. It's, to do, it's on white people and people with power in these organizations to change the dynamic. And I know that's a controversial thing to say in some places, but to me, I've seen it and it, it, it won't, it's not gonna fix itself without a lot of effort um, and without a sincere effort. And it can't just be for show. Um, we have to insist on representation, on representation of women and people of color and other underrepresented groups um, in our organizations. Um, and when they say they tried, they probably didn't try going to a historically black college or university to recruit or uh, to uh, National Society of Black Engineers or the Society of Hispanic Engineers or the Society of Women Engineers. There are plenty of networks and there's really no excuse anymore for not recruiting from div more diverse pools of people um, and not reaching out, opening up, expanding your network. So if you look around at your place of work or in your life or your professional network and, there are no and everyone looks like you, it's on you to fix that. Um, and the third thing I'll say is, is back to the, the governance issue. Um, look at your company, look at your organization, who's on the board, if you work for an employee owned company, which many of you do, who's on the board, it's your company. You should have a say, ask, ask questions, speak up. Only 20% of uh, corporate boards ha uh, have women on them. Not good, better than it used to be, still not good. Um, when women are at the table, it makes a huge difference. I've seen it uh, in person. So uh, we really can't afford as a society to wait and hope that it gets better. Because I don't know about you, but 208 years seems like a really long time to me. Uh, and uh, I'm an impatient person. So uh, those are the three areas that I think everyone who's listening today uh, can do something about. Thank you so much. Um, Liz. Yes. Uh, when I was at, I'm not, I don't have any solutions, but I, do have some sort of facts, okay? And one fact was when I was on the board of MassDOT in the MBTA, uh, the, uh, the board had only one white man and of the five, and then five, a total of five people. So it was a very diverse board and it had no trouble functioning that way. <laughs> it was really quite, impressive how well it functioned. And that was in part because the governor was behind it and people respected their differences. But you see, you can see a lot of change happen if you've got the people aligned to make sure it happens. The other thing I've seen is be bold. And at my college, which was Wellesley College, they wanted to attract a more diverse uh, population. And they went out and they recruited a dynamite uh, lady who happened to be uh, 
black, brown. And it was welcome by everyone. It was, in, people were enthusiastic to have someone who was excellent uh, and of high quality. And so I think being bold, we talked about filling the uh, pipeline, Elisa did that well. I think having people speak in, in their own voice, okay, matters. And what I've seen is that regardless of what the color is, that people who advance, uh, well, who, who advance well in their job also seem to have the ability to tell their story well and to be resilient. And those are, are qualities that you look for in, in terms of uh, recruitment. And finally, I just want to say that it's all of our job, jobs to teach our kids and our grandkids the power of diversity. And if you do that right, that's a gift for life. Thank you very much. Phyllis. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, where do we go from here? Well, speaking specifically from a wastewater treatment plant operator perspective, uh, we must mentor our female operators. But first, we need to find out where they are. Now, I'm on a Facebook page that, or Facebook group that um, is for female wastewater treatment plant and water operators. Right. And it's a wonderful group. The experienced operators uh, provide guidance, uh, suggestions. Um, we help each other with troubleshooting problems, mechanical, laboratory. And uh, it's a safe space for women who work in a facility where they're the only woman. Um, we need to encourage these women to sit for their operator's licenses so that they can move up the ladder and apply for those upper level positions when they become available. We've even had some women ask who were um, going to be interviewed for promotions. You know, what should I say? And the responses were just superb. Um, so it's encouraging them to continue moving up the ladder at their wastewater treatment facilities or um, at others. And also, I think that it's important to encourage women, engineers, operators, you name it, to run for uh, a local office, either run for or be a uh, run for like Megan, or to be appointed such as myself to um, boards on their local communities. Because again, your voice matters, your voice counts. And the more diversity we can get on these boards and in these wastewater treatment plants, it will benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've come to the last question, which is an opportunity for you each to give us uh, some closing thoughts. Um, I had joked earlier that I know that each of you could write a book about, uh, about your experiences and so forth. And I'm reminded Liz did that. Um, so we all need to, to read that. I certainly do, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but I'm hoping that you might each um, take this opportunity to share some thoughts, kind of your elevator speech, if you will, your thoughts about if there's just one or a few things you would like for folks to remember um, about your careers and your experiences as a woman in, um, in a male-dominated field, um, that, what would that be? Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elisa. So I'll, I'll summarize it because I, I like to think in threes. Um, and I'll say, speak up, show up, and stand up. Speak up when you hear or see something that you know isn't right, but also speak up to amplify each other's voices. If there are two women in the room, back each other up, have each other's backs. I love the group that Phyllis mentioned. I'm in that group too. And it's, it's so much fun to see the, the interaction there uh, and the young women uh, on their way up. Um, 
show up, honor your commitments, you know, think about something you can do to make, make a change, honor your commitments, get in good trouble as the late John Lewis had admonished us and stand up, identify your own values, act accordingly. If you're gonna make a decision, think about whether uh, you know, whether it is in alignment with your values and with all the, the goals and the, the lofty ideals that we've talked about here today. Um, and then persist. That's what we need to do, nevertheless. Thank you so much. Liz. Yeah, I, ju I just, my book had its last chapter saying that the next chapter is yours, okay? And I think that the next chapter is not mine. It is all of you. You've made me feel like it's in great shape. But I have always had a love for the work I did advancing women. And I think that if you have a passion for it, you can create that passion. And it is very valuable in terms of balancing with all the things that might not go so well in terms of the rate of which change happens, et cetera. But if you're there and you've got the right attitude and you're pushing along somehow, I think it's gonna happen for all of us. Thank you so much. Phyllis. Yes, she kind of stole my thunder there <laughs> in a good way. Um, follow your passion. It can take you everywhere. When I first started in this profession, I was shy and um, I knew I had a lot I wanted to say, but I was afraid to say it. And then there was an issue that came up that needed to be addressed by a committee that I was chairing and it just took off from there. I, I just think if you are passionate about what you do, you will love it. And, you know, we've got a profession that is interesting, it's challenging, it protects the environment, it pays well, and it won't be moved overseas. If you love this profession like I do, don't let anything hold you back. Wonderful. Thank you. And Megan. Thank you. I want to say ditto to everything the previous panelists said, but I also want to just leave this one thought that the learning never stops. And so I think a lot of times we try to think of things as a destination and I just need to get there and we're, we're good. And I just want to emphasize that this conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion isn't a destination. It's a journey. And, you know, I think so many of us like to sit there and go, well, I'm not racist or I don't have unconscious bias, I'm good. And it's really important to recognize that we're all human and we all have our unconscious biases and we all have areas that we can improve, whether it's being an ally, whether it's being an advocate, whether it's simply just creating spaces for different perspectives and different voices. And so my, my big thing today is that the learning never stops. And so sometimes it's about pausing to rethink things. Sometimes it's about pausing to unlearn things. And then it's about constantly learning more so that we can broaden our perspectives and so that we can help achieve that journey towards equity. But if, if we're 208 years away from women and men having equality in the States, then we're, oh my goodness, <laughs> so far away from achieving equality for all not to mention across the world. And so we have big audacious goals and it's going to take all of us collectively to help inch us further along towards progress. And so I just hope that we can all enjoy bigger pieces of pie and I hope that we can all keep learning. Thank you. And I hope you'll share that website when we put out our resources so that we can go to it. I can't help but think, you know, because of, um, um, Black History Month and Women's History Month, PBS is running incredible shows. And I caught 
part of nine to five last night, which is a documentary, not the movie, but the movie was a part of the documentary. And when you talk about this, you know, are we two, how many hundreds of years out are we? And to think about some of the history I shared earlier, and that so many of the issues that were discussed hundreds of years ago for women are still being discussed. And that includes pay equity, which they talked about way back when. And nine to five also talked about women who were very nervous about speaking. And I thought about this breaking the barrier of spheres that women can be in the sphere of speaking and how hard it is. It's, it's really hard. So I thank each of you. These have been wonderful. And we do have a few questions coming in. So I'm gonna read one and, um, and see which of you might like to, to jump in. We've got a couple here. Um, there are many women with families at home who seem to quote, do it all. Do you have any tips for how to find a meaningful balance between family life and work life without feeling left behind career-wise compared to uh, one's male counterparts or, or peers? Anybody who might like to? to take that? Phyllis, by chance? Liz, it's I tough. Think, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's yeah. tough. I mean, that's, that's the recognition there. But um, I, I will pass it over to my, my fellow panelists, if you have anything to, to add. I, I have to think about that a minute. I don't have kids, so I feel like I'm not qualified to answer that altogether, except to say that what we talked about before about family friend friendly policies, government and co corporate policies, you know, somehow men seem to have children and not get off the corporate yeah. ladder, you know, so Liz has, Liz probably. I'll, 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 I'll put in my two cents. First of all, most of the women that I know uh, who are working, they're working really, really hard. So with family, I mean, you're not, they, you know, they call them up. It's like, I have to find the time because they're exhausted. Uh, so a lot more needs to be done with regard to, uh, friendly, but I worked, I got, uh, I worked, I got a, um, master's degree, two of them on Metcalf and Abbey while I worked and while I had kids. And I think my advice is first to see what your care is that you need and make sure that you put a priority on having the kind of care that you need. And second, you need to go to, if you have a spouse, go to your spouse and get the rules about who does what. <laughs> and that is, you know, my, my kids all, all do their wash. That's because, you know, my husband did the wash. My son started to do the wash and then his, my other son did the wash. So if they see, you know, they can be much more helpful than if they don't see. Uh, but I think the women have to stand up and say, hey, I, I need the help. And if they're there uh, to make sure that it, it's participatory. My friend Ann told me that it was better to train the men than it was anything you that if you put the resources in the woman it's not gonna really work unless you're also training the two of them together so yeah i'll do yeah please take him oh i was just gonna add to that i think liz kind of talked about you know that whole concept of we have to rethink what we think in, is labor, right? And so whether it's the emotional labor that you put in, whether it's the division of household labor, whatever that is, we have to consider all of that as part of work. And so it takes brain energy and it takes physical energy to do all of those things. And so dividing those chores and responsibilities and recognizing you can't do it all. And so prioritizing that and dividing that labor and communicating that effectively is part of that solution. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a follow-up to this that's come in, and I'll read that. We're seeing in the pandemic that women's careers are being set back because many women are leaving their jobs to assume full-time caregiver roles. How can organizations support women at this time and beyond the pandemic? Floor is open. 
<laughs> is it organizations like business organizations or like well, women's that's, groups? That's but, a good question. I think you could read it both ways. Um, and possibly it's, um, it's organizations, um, it could be companies or businesses where women are working and what can they do to help support them so that they don't leave? That could be one right. way. I, I would, if it's, if we're talking about business organizations, I mean, telecommunication is big and it's um, being supported by more uh, platforms that are out there because of the pandemic. Is it possible for you to, for your employer to allow you to telecommunicate? Um, that and yes, you'd be working at home and having a family. I, and I realize that's a really tough, tough situation. But that is one way that your employer you could be supported is by, especially you know if they don't want you to go, um, try to you know, leverage that by talking to them about what your what your options are. With um, so that you can stay employed during this time. This yeah, and I think, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to add, I think Phyllis brings up a really great point. And I think that the pandemic has really not only given us an opportunity to reimagine what the future of work looks like, but it's also forced us to explore that in many cases. I've heard a number of CEOs and general managers say, you know, I always said that we couldn't be flexible with telecommunications. Well, the pandemic forced us to be flexible with telecommunications and actually forced us to make it work. And I think that's really what it is. It's about rethinking work. And instead of just saying, no, that can't happen, it's really reimagining and really truly assessing, okay, I have an operator who has to show up on site, but there's also other workload that they could do at home. And so how can we stagger their shifts accordingly to minimize physical contact and so forth, keeping them safe, but also keeping our plants operational and so forth. So it really can't be this black and white, yes or no, can't do it, super inflexible. It's really about reimagining how we're doing work, reassessing, and then also acknowledging that each individual is a whole person with a whole different life outside of work that they still bring to work. And there are more and more workplaces that acknowledge that if someone's experiencing challenges in the household, it affects who they are at work. It affects their personalities, it, it, it affects their productivity, and it affects their ability to be the best that they can be at work. And so the more employers are open about having those conversations and acknowledging that people bring in other responsibilities, whether it's care of a child, whether it's care of a parent, whether it's care of a sibling or something else or somebody else, it's recognizing that everyone may have different stressors and different, different influences that may impact their ability to be their whole best person at work. And a lot of business best practices during the pandemic have showed that managers and teammates who ask about their personal well-being tend to have a much more communicative, open, and productive workspace. And so even in this virtual pandemic environment, we can and must rethink how we evaluate our employees and don't just view them as your transactional employees who are there from eight to five or nine to five or 7.30 to 10.30, whatever it is, it's they're a human being with a life and part of their workday is here, but how can we work and flex so that we can accommodate everything happening in their lives today? Great, thank you. Elise or Liz on that one? I think I, I, the only thing covered. I would say is that flexibility is something that lots of women want uh, on the job. So the more the uh, employer has flexibility as options, I think it is going to be received very well. And perhaps encouraging employers to be more flexible, which That's is right. what the, the pandemic has sort of done that in so many ways, right? They've 
force people to learn that, oh, well, maybe they can be flexible. I heard the same thread through all these comments about flexibility and the need um, and the need to be less rigid and to explore options and expand the pie, so to speak. And just like you're talking about making the table bigger is to, to expand the options and so forth. Um, I have one more thing to read here, it looks like. Um, somebody said, Megan, good point. Such a continued challenge for our industry. I'm concerned about the statistics that, uh, the statistic that only 30% of women who earn bachelor's degrees in engineering are still working in engineering 20 years later. What can we do to encourage young women to enter and stay in engineering? And that could be for Megan and everybody, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a topic I'm very passionate about because I have a lot of friends that I've had heart-to-heart -heart conversations with where they made the conscious, conscious choice not only to leave the water industry, but also to leave engineering. And so that's why I highlighted that key point on not only is recruitment important, but it's retention. And I think the conversation we had about the questions prior to this kind of address a lot of that, right? It's really about recognizing who, who are we trying to retain and how can we keep them? Because if we're not providing the accommodations and if we're not creating an inclusive workspace, they show us by leaving and our statistics show us that. And so we're clearly not doing what we can to be inclusive, to have equity, to create spaces for these voices, to create spaces for these perspectives. And truly when, when we're in the water industry and we're caring about water quality and we're caring about the environment and infrastructure, we're also missing out on a whole section of our population who are the caretakers, who are the ones who are, who are concerned about the water quality for their kids, who are the ones who are bathing their children and washing the clothes and so forth. And so it's really, really important that we reimagine what the future of work looks like and we really take conscious efforts to recognize that people bring in a lot to the table. And I will say personally, I've had conversations with a lot of female engineers in this industry who have said, I know I put a ceiling on my career when I chose to have kids. I know I put a ceiling on my career when I chose to go part-time. I know I put a ceiling on my career when I chose to do X, Y, and Z. I have a friend right now who's taking care of full-time taking care of her parents couldn't even choose, make the choice to have kids. And so it's really, really important that we recognize that people are diverse, dynamic individuals outside of work. And if we want to keep and retain great talent, we have to rethink how we not only recruit them, but also retain them. So flexibility is a key thing, but also recognizing that if we lose these individuals, we're losing a huge voice and a perspective that we need to create great engineering solutions and projects and programs. And I think to those of us in the position to be mentors for those people, um, and how lucky would you be to have a mentor like, like you know, one of these wonderful women, um, you know, really have to step up and, and sponsor, not just, not just like give them a shoulder to cry on, but to really sponsor their development and encourage them to invest in themselves and their, in their careers and help pave the way, you know, and open a door or two for them as well. Thank you. Any last words from uh, Phyllis and Liz? And then we're just about out of time. Any, any last thoughts? Um, well, I will just add, because I think we are at the end of our time. First of all, I'm so thrilled that this is being taped because I think recorded, I'm sorry, recorded, because this has been a fabulous conversation. And each of you, uh, it's been an honor and pleasure to get to know you as we planned for this, but also today to hear your wonderful thoughts and insights uh, about your careers and about uh, your interest in how to help others so that uh, there is there are more women and there's more diversity uh, in the workforce in this field of water that you all love so much as scientists. And I am in awe of your work and what you've done. And it's been a true pleasure uh, to be with you today. And I thank you and the organization for highlighting the 19th Amendment as our segue to this conversation about today, because it is, it is, uh, it is ongoing. Thank you. And I'm supposed to turn it over to Angela, I think. Yes, thank you. And um, before we wrap up, I just want to remind people to fill out the poll. Um, I think we have some questions so you can receive the uh, TCH credits. 
And I believe you answer the question just um, in the chat box off to your right. Um, this was an amazing discussion. I loved hearing from uh, Lisa and Liz about the history of when, because I can personally remember Mary Berry taking my hand and Michaela Bogosh's hand and introducing us to Jess Englehart and Danielle DeRuza and Katie Ronan and saying, you know, these women are fabulous. You have to meet them, get to know them, develop this when YP group. And we did a few years ago. And I'm so excited that it's given us the opportunity to have this discussion. And so I wanna sincerely thank Freddie Kay and all the panelists for working with us over these past few months. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And to all the attendees, we will be sending you a survey. We wanna hear your feedback. We wanna know, do you wanna continue this discussion and in what forum and any specific topic? So please keep your eye out for that. And the email will also include a link to the NUIA website where we'll have contact information for these amazing panelists as well as a link to several resources that are provided by the panelists. And we'll show you how to continue to educate yourself on this very important topic. So good evening, everyone. Um, have, a, have a great night, be safe, be well, and thank you so much. <laughs>